Uh, we're here in Phillip Island at the World Superbike Championship. I'm with Paul from Pata Yamaha. G'day, mate. Hello. How nice are you? Nice to meet you, man. You too. And uh, you're going to tell us a little bit about this uh, pretty incredible machine behind you there. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I guess the first thing, I mean, I don't know a lot about motorbikes, so this is pretty new to me. How much difference is this to like the sort of thing you can just buy from the, your local Yamaha dealer? And like, what differences are there between that and uh, what you've got here? Well, it's a strange one, you know, because the bike is basically exactly the same and completely different all at the same time. It has to start as a production bike. So the main frame, the main chassis of the bike is based on the production uh, machine. Mm -hmm. But aside from that and the main engine crankcases, you can pretty much change everything. So in terms of numbers, we take a 20,000 euro uh, machine, which I guess is 30,000 Aussie dollars or so something like that. Um, making around 180, 190 horsepower and weighing around 200 kilos. Uh, and what we have here, uh, the Pata Yamaha uh, World Superbike R1 is uh, a little bit more expensive at around 150,000 euro um, for the complete build cost of the machine, uh, making 240 horsepower and weighing only 168 kilos. So you, you're into your cars, right? Yes. So you know how it feels when you've, you know, you can't even imagine something like, uh, you know, latest uh, top-end sports car you know this isn't one-to-one -one in terms of horsepower to kilo this is you know approaching 1.3 1.4 horsepower for every kilo and when the bike's leaning over in the corner the rider has about 20 mil an inch of uh, rubber on the ground so the amount of control the rider needs through his hand and the throttle grip uh, to control that power but also the sophistication of the electronics uh, and to help the rider to control that power has become uh, very critical over the last few years so uh, Cars are great, cars are fun, but this thing's the real bomb. It's, uh, it's uh, 340 kilometer an hour top speed, and uh, we won't quite achieve that with the headwind here at Phillip Island this weekend. Um, but uh, they're quite a special thing, and considering that so many of the components in the engine have to remain standard, the crank cases, uh, the crank shaft, um, they're, uh, it's a tribute to how trick the uh, standard road bikes really So are. where does that extra power come from? If you can't change, so the pistons and all that sort of stuff is more uh, change no, for the, durability wise? You know that it's it, the piston is standard. Okay. Um, so even the piston is standard, but horsepower in a uh, four stroke engine is all made in the cylinder head and the inlet and the uh, exhaust. And uh, so the cylinder head itself in terms of the port shape and the combustion shape, the camshafts, the exhaust system, the intake system, um, and of course the power of the ECU itself uh, all contributes but it's, uh, it is amazing how much extra power is latent in that engine because basically if you take the cylinder head off you pretty much put it back on after the tuning and that's what makes the horsepower the bottom end of the engine is pretty much stopped. Really? Yeah. And uh, like red line is that change between the road bike and this one? Yeah quite considerably um, but in the regulations we're only allowed about three percent more RPM compared to standard. Okay. So I forget I think standard's 14.2, 14.3 on the R1 we make 14.7 if the regulations would allow us we could rev to 15, 15 and a bit uh, quite happily. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that's one of those uh, tools that the uh, organisers have to either restrict or improve someone's performance is to either pull down or increase the RPM limit. Um, so, because uh, they are all production engines, yeah. modified heavily, um, but uh, the ultimate RPM can be uh, something that can control the power a little bit. And so I know like with rally and so on, you've got things like restrictors on your intake and yep. that sort of stuff so that people have got a bit of a parity. Yeah. Is there other sort of aspects? Is it just weight and RPM or is there other restrictions on your category? That Not so much. I mean, there are some cost restrictions. Certain parts cannot cost more than a given. That, that applies to suspension and quite a few of the chassis parts. Um, we also, as the official Yamaha team, when our engineers develop a particular specification of camshaft that gives the bike more power, uh, we have to make those accessible to any other team uh, running a Yamaha. So the idea is to try and have a team that's a good group of engineers, a good group of guys, but doesn't have a huge budget to develop and do all the R&D to better use the manufacturer's R&D to make their bike uh, a similar level of performance. So that works quite well in the championship, yeah. Okay. And on the actual bike, like we were discussing, like the, the changes between the road bike, I mean, obviously the engine's one thing. What other changes do you make? Like, um, are there upgrades to the suspension? The oh, I mean, like what, what other changes have you got? The Olin's front fork in the bike here 
and the rear shock, just those two components together cost more than the standard road bike, the complete. <laughs> so the quality of the suspension components, quality of the Brembo brake components, the rear swing arm, uh, the Is the same length as factory? Or? No, actually we yeah. tend to make it a little bit longer because as you get more and more power, yeah. uh, you increase the bike wanting to stand on the rear wheel and wheelie. So tend to have a little bit more um, uh, swing arm length and different uh, stiffnesses of swing arm to aid the handling and what have you. Uh, the electronics are completely different. Uh, Magneti Morelli uh, ECU, very more powerful uh, control unit with a lot more strategy options. Carbon fiber, of course, everywhere to reduce the weight. Uh, the exhaust system is full titanium Akropovich. We make ACE systems for cars as well. They are, they are the, uh, the go-to people uh, yeah. for cool, cool car systems. So there's not much on the bike apart from the main frame, the crankcases and the main engine construction, and some of the big internal bits like uh, pistons and uh, crankshaft that stay the same. Um, so everything cooling system, the whole lot, that's all? Cooling, yeah, we need so much more cooling than yeah. standard because of the extra horsepower. Um, because of the extra RPM and also the packaging to keep the bike off the ground in the corners the packaging's a lot more uh, compact as well um, but uh, no it's a big it's a big increase in power over standard a big reduction in weight and it's quite impressive considering um, uh, you know the uh, high performance that the standard road bike already has because uh, one of our riders Michael or Alex if they jump put good tires slick tires on a stock Yamaha R1 the difference in lap time around this track would be around five seconds only. So it's a quite a long track too. So that's, yeah, that's it's a, it's, a, it's an awful feat. it's an awful lot of investment to find that last bit of performance. And you know, today we're missing half a second in our rhythm compared to the fastest riders and scratching our heads to go half a second faster. But that's the nature of uh, motorsport. Okay. Yeah, that's very true. Now, electronics-wise, uh, I know you've got some pretty tricky electronics here. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few rider aids, and they've become. Uh, there's a lot of debate about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but in the end, on street bikes, top end street bikes, not only sports bikes like these, but like the adventure bikes, um, electronics are becoming so much more important. They make the bike so much more fun and safe to ride. Mm -hmm. You know, on the latest bikes, a lesser quality rider can feel the rear tire sliding a little bit and feel safer. So it's important that um, racing is used to develop further these. Uh, they're not only safety aids, they're fun aids as well, you yeah. know, to make the bike uh, nicer to ride. Um, and on these we have, uh, as you say, traction control uh, to try and, you don't stop the spinning, but to try and control the angle of the bike and how far so the bike goes outside. Bit sideways around and the and... riders will still go sideways. There's still the capacity to go full sideways and crash. Um, I've you know, seen they're a few not of those today. exactly. It's not a it's not a catch-all situation. Electronics. It's a help, um, but it's really not something that. Uh, you know, there's, it's not possible to ride this bike and just be at full lean angle in the corner and just open the gas because that'll end badly. Yeah. The rider still has the biggest control over everybody. And of course, you mentioned it earlier, we can't influence from the pit box what the rider's doing on the track, either technically or operationally, because it's very much still a gladiatorial sport, you know, man against man when they're out there. And once we push the guys down pit lane and they're gone, they're on their own. The only thing we see them is every one minute, 30 seconds or so with a pit board to tell them, how many more laps to go? So no radio, no nothing. Zero, you're not allowed any pit to ride a communication and, and no pit to bike communication. And for me, I think that's a great thing because uh, it makes it more of a human sport. Uh, there's more that the rider has to take responsibility for. We've got some yeah. telemetry on the bike here, uh -huh. um, the, but that's not for us, that's actually for the organizers. Okay. That's to check certain uh, uh, functions on the bike are within the regulations basically. Yeah. So uh, to do with tire pressure and stuff like that. So. Um, that's, um, you know, it's very easy to send telemetry back, but we're not allowed to do it as a team. And I think that's a great thing, you know, because uh, when the green light goes out, it's a fight. It's a, it's a war and the guys are on their own and uh, they've got to make it happen. Yeah. Through the straight at 320, yeah. and they can identify which one your pit is and still see. The pit board, and not only that, they can see a lot of information. Have a look at the dash here. Um, they can see a lot of information on the dash in terms of uh, gear position, uh, shift lights, that's it, waking up and just saying hello to you. Um, and uh, they have a lot of information on there in terms of uh, which option they've got on the electronic mapping, uh, the last lap time uh, they've just achieved, um, what the current lap time um, is after they've gone past the pit, etc. So I, I find it unbelievable as well that at that speed, with that much intensity, the riders 
have uh, so much ability uh, to take in everything, not only from the team on the pit board, but what they're doing on the dash, and then maybe adjust the settings. So what, uh, are they, by what, the what adjustments here. does the driver? The basically, the yeah, never call them a <laughs> driver. I've been making uh, that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, on the bike, the guys can program before the rider goes out what's on the switches. So they might switch to say switch A to switch B and uh, that will be less power in a certain corner. Okay. It might be more traction control in another corner. Um, and, uh, so the, also the, the bike knows where it is on the track? Then it can yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the bike via a basic meter counter yep. knows exactly where it is and it's divided up into sectors. So for example, if we have a third gear corner on that part of the track, but there's a lot more grip, for example, there's less bumps or it's just a better quality asphalt and another third gear corner over there, we can have a less power Okay. being transmitted through there so um, it's important that the bike feels consistent to the rider for the whole lap but sometimes particularly as you enter the corner the amount of engine brake you have and on exit the amount of traction control or power you have it's quite uh, uh, a good tool to be able to uh, adjust it corner by corner okay. you could argue it's a you know why bother the problem is everyone else has got it okay so you have to have all these toys if everyone else has got it if no one else has got it it's not a problem you know but uh, um, so these, these buttons here, if uh, I, I heard someone saying that they really control adjustments and all that sort of thing. Yeah, well. we, via, via basically you, the guys can turn the uh, pit lane speed limiter on and turn it back off again. Um, they can just scroll up and scroll down on the trash control, that means more control or less control. And then they can set, hit the uh, map button and scroll through the maps and they will have spoken to their engineers before they go out and okay, they know that when map switch A comes up, that means they've already been told, okay, it's got less power for this section of the track, or it's got more wheelie control, or it's okay. got something else to try. Um, so then on the pit board as a reminder, because as you say, there's a lot going on, we'll just put map or switch as a sign on the board. Okay, okay this lap, I'm gonna change the switch and okay. uh, try that. Once the bike comes back in the pits, you then offload the data. Yeah. I guess that's what all these folks back there are doing. E exactly, and it's a, to, to fix the bike and improve the bike is a combination of what the rider is saying in terms of the confidence they need out of the bike and what they're feeling, and then what the data is actually giving the engineers to study. You know, Sometimes the rider might feel that the I don't know. Rear position is, uh, you know, the rear suspension sitting in too low, and it's causing the bike to wheelie. But in fact, it can be that the rear suspension is too hard and too high, and the bike is just pivoting on the rear shock and making it wheelie. So, you have to check the data to confirm the rider comment and uh, try and improve the bike. And um, right now, the biggest challenge for us is to increase the rear tire life on this track because it's so fast and the bike's lent over for so long. It's got unique challenges, Phillip Island, for, I guess for the cars as well, but for the bikes, just making the rear tire do 22 laps is a real challenge. So um, that's what we'll be working on and uh, tomorrow afternoon we'll find out if we've uh, done a good job or not. Oh, well, uh, good luck tomorrow. Thanks, and, uh, mate. We'll be uh, kind of chatting to you then. Please do. There you go. Cool, Les. Nice to meet you, man. You're welcome. No problem.